Hey everybody, welcome back today. I have a very special episode for you. I had an opportunity to sit down with a very good friend of mine, Kirsten Otis, from the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas. And Kirsten is the audio and visual design director at the Houston uh, Museum there. And he's in charge of all the art projects that get set up in the museum that basically use all the technology that we talk about on this channel, uh, especially CRTs. So he came into town, wanted to see my shop, and we had an opportunity to sit down and discuss all kinds of different topics, uh, specifically revolving around CRT uh, restoration, maintenance, how he and the museum actually get equipment, and then um, mostly how they store it, all kinds of great topics. We also get into some different art pieces that are going on around the country. So I really hope you enjoy this special treat that we have here today. Um, and if you do like this kind of content, please do me a favor and hit the like button. But right now, let's get into the interview with Kirsten Otis. Kirsten, how's it going? And uh, thank you for coming. Well, it's great, Steve. I appreciate it. I was, uh, had to come up to DC to pick up a truck and uh, figured out that you're on my way back. So it worked <laughs> out real well after about two hours of sitting in traffic, made it here. Uh, weather's great. Um, it's about 90 and that same percentage of humidity in Houston right now. So really. yeah, um, I definitely remember when I visited Houston, even though it was just May, it was actually like a, it's pretty interesting. It was like a yeah. year ago yeah. when I was in Houston with you and um, we, uh, we definitely experienced some more heat there than here in Virginia. But um, yeah, so you're with the museum and um, why don't you, you know, give us kind of an idea of what it is that you do like uh, on a normal kind of day. Well, I, I'll start by, I ran into you from trying to figure out who was jacking up prices on all the PVMs over the last 10 years or so. So I started by finding My Life in Gaming, and they're basically the culprits from the beginning, and uh, then caught your channel kind of in the mix of all of that. And by that point, I was trying to figure out how to maintain what we did have. And the we have one CRT guy in town, which is one of the largest cities in the whole country, and he's past retirement age and does not like working. So we uh, were looking for something a little more um, dependable. So that's why that's how you ended up in Houston. But the I came there from working in um, local theaters in town, landmark theaters, and so I was the main projectionist. Then had a few other jobs. I was in the army at that time, and uh, my friend was the projectionist at the museum. He had been there thirty years since the early eighties, and. I had come in to assist with a few things. I was going to college at that point when I started there, and the other art installer quit unexpectedly, so I got brought in and had one year left in school, took a break from that for a while, and came back. But I fairly quickly took over exhibition design there for the video art, and um, that was a very jumping into a fire situation. There was no inventory. There was no real standard for how it was being done. They were in the middle between transitioning between DVD players and VCRs and Mac Minis that would play the art into these solid state playback devices that are at this point basically devices that you'd use in menu boards. So it'd be a either it bright sign is a company that makes most of them, but they're digital signage and they can sync together for multi monitor display. So museums like them because it's much easier than syncing 10 DVD players and hoping it keeps running for three months. So that's kind of evolved into me taking over the video department at the museum. So we run two movie theaters that show 35 and 16 millimeter plus digital cinema and a incredibly large inventory of equipment for the exhibitions, which I've got a list of all the CRTs, but it's probably around 60 or so at this point, um, like dozens of projectors, a whole slew of old playback devices from Umatic to VHS, Betacam, film projectors and we also run zoom meetings because that's what everybody does now so yeah uh, well mixed there, in all of it there's definitely some things have changed obviously since um you know 2019 and 2020 and uh so we definitely have that video meeting kind of thing happening and then if you're in like 
the professional world and you're probably anywhere near audio video, somebody's probably going to look to you, right, to try to <laughs> teach everybody even more than you're like trying to do. Um, and I don't want to get too much into that kind of it, but let's so let's let's get on some fun stuff. Um, we were talking about equipment and you said you kind of walked into a job where you had um like taken over a pretty hectic position there at the point this all happened and um when you're in charge of the audio video department all of a sudden you have this huge inventory of crts uh analog video equipment that is like super cool to us you know nerds and uh things but so you walk in and you get this and you're trying to like put your arms around this a little bit at first. So is it, is this just, is this, were you super into um, maybe CRTs like outside of work or is this mostly been because of work? The and renewed interest comes with the museum and that's, so I, mean, I grew up, I was born in 79. So I grew up exactly with the evolution of gaming from the NES on. My parents had an Intellivision and i had every nintendo system through the gamecube and a genesis and kind of skipped a lot of the 32-bit stuff and then came back in with more recent things and what followed around when nesticle and the other emulators came out around late 90s early 2000s i was very insane that that was even a concept really and even had like a commodore for a while and ran a little bbs for like six months at my house which was very strange um and still have that and actually On bbs sold. that's funny yeah that's like you still have the oh you still have the commodore yeah. oh yeah no not I mean, the bbs i was gonna but, say uh, and they're still managing yeah, there's the three BBS. people that doing? log on every day <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> no but i sold one of them to my life in gaming action yes they, they used it in one of their shots i think uh, uh and the, the little monitor and everything the the curse or the uh the commodore crt right mm. yeah that was the one i had um done a repair video on a gosh three or four years yep. ago so you did grow up you know like in that whole scene and then you get to the museum and now you have all these crazy amounts of pbms i'm looking at this list here of yeah of crazy crts and uh so i know that like most of these you're just like you walk in and you start are they are they organized was like the we've probably acquired i've doubled the collection maybe tripled okay. it so we started with um the the two 1900s the early pvm cvms and the 20 in ones that's just kind of the mid grain mid-range 1920 inch and this weird mitsubishi this like insane 29 inch it's like 300 pounds and that was i've just been acquiring things since then like all the nine and five inch are for a specific installation mm -hmm. that was supposed to go to paris um right before the shutdown happened and it was fly it had already left and i was supposed to fly to paris and then international traveled stopped the day before i flew out so yeah i missed being stuck in paris for two years but <laughs> the yeah we've just been finding like all the 2030s i've bought since we've gotten there and i think two of you actually fixed one while you were in town which was exceedingly helpful that one was damaged in shipment yeah. as they all tend to be but um so now we have four that work great we're trying to get more we got eight of those dotronics sets to for the new building opening and um the, other than not having shielding they're totally fine for what they do they're not as high-end as trinitrons but they're also way yeah. less expensive well i think that um let's so so yeah i'm looking at a list here and and just to give everybody kind of an idea i'll read off some of these things you talked about one exhibit that was set to go to paris right yep and it was basically involving uh, most of these. You have, goodness, 16 9Ls and six 5041Qs. Um, and actually, that's that's pretty impressive because most of the 8s are earlier than that, or the 9 inches are earlier than that, and kind of uh, need a lot of servicing usually. So that's probably better for you to have those newer ones. But what was, what was that exhibit supposed to be um with those it's um so it's part of the latin art collection the two to give a frame of reference the artists that tend to use the 
CRTs the most heavy in the Latin department, especially in the 90s. Very common. They'll do large arrays, and it seems mostly like everybody saw Namjoon Pike's work in the 70s, 80s, and 90s and adapted that to their own ideas. So the modern department has a Namjoon Pike, for example, and then other works that uh, have used CRTs, like one specifically by Roy Fridge. He's a Texan from Dallas, and it's a videotape he took with a video camera in his freezer running. So it's just a slow swirl of the ice crystals in there. It looks incredible, but he's very specific about being on a black old tube TV and cause it's supposed to look like you were looking inside something. So you'll get these restrictions about those. So the one with the five, nine and 14 inches, the 14s were added by the curator. The original design is only five and nine inch on these three steps. They're playing three different videos. There's a surround sound setup, and he just sent three pictures of drawings no equipment. So probably the problem that museums have is we'll get like Namjoon Pike sends equipment with his installations, but most artists are, here's some VHS tapes and some drawings I made 30 years ago, figure it out. So <laughs> I went he, wow. for his original installation and most of Namjoon Pike's, they use consumer TVs because they're artists. They don't always have a lot of money. So we, when I, they wanted to put this up, I'm like, we're buying good monitors for this. So they were still cheap then. These were maybe fifty dollars each for most mm -hmm. of these. The 14s were expensive, but the nines and fives were nothing. It was more to ship them than to buy them. So that worked out extremely well. And I just bought extras because I think it uses 18 total for the work. But the curator thought they were too small at the end, so she brought in 20s and 14s, which was fun. And the artist was fine with it, but that's easy. That's the one of the more interesting ones we had to buy a ton for that were extremely specific. So you brought up some names there, like Namju Pike is probably the most well known, I would think. He's the catalyst. Right. That uh that that did all this video art and really took things to a crazy next level sometimes, especially towards the end and some of those pieces he has. What is it like when you're dealing with somebody like let's say Namju Pike for example, if you did a exhibit for them is that like more is is that owned by some kind of entity now that manages that kind of well it's family? case by case like that when you worked on the joker two videos that was kind of specific on mm -hmm. how they wanted that like one of the ones i saw the version of his was two on top of each other hanging from the ceiling revert one on each facing each direction and they were bolted together and it was i think 14 inch pvms and it's just looked like a big cube but for pike specifically his he is exceedingly specific with his, but once he got older, he put in clauses for his works that allow you to change the displays as technology advances. So the one that we have is Rose Art Memory, and it's a f very elaborate frame with 20 CRTs in it, and that's two channels of video. And like our masters for that are on Laserdisc. And, but the originals were on pneumatic and we we can wow. actually get that from his video editor still lives in New York and is very, really good guy. But for that one, it started with uh, a bunch of nine inch CRTs from Korea because he's Korean and they were just little like kitchen counter TVs like your mother yeah. had sitting yeah. on the counter so she could watch TV while she was cooking. It has a little like <laughs> LCD channel thing in the bottom and some buttons and <clears throat> the power supply is external on them. They're small. Power brick looks like the original Xbox like 360 power brick. Okay, like, yeah. It is big. so big. So there's yeah. 20 of them against the oh, wow. wall. 20 of those bricks, it just overheated instantly. <laughs> so those TVs basically died within a year yeah. of it running, and they replaced it with these 9-inch flat screens, which are basically medical device monitors, like kind of small with like a mount uh -huh. or camera tops. Very expensive, like exceedingly so for the image quality. But it also looked terrible comparatively because it's a digital display. Yeah. It doesn't have that same effect of them, so... All those TVs slowly, enough of them died that we pulled the piece and our, we have a media conservator coming in finally, actually. So we're going to work with her to get it back to its original. So we've got two sets of the original CRTs in storage and are going to come bring them in and go through all of them and find a way to provide power that isn't 20 heat generating power bricks in an enclosed space. So that, that one's, but that one is, it's interesting because he's letting things evolve. Yeah. There are, but every work they give you paperwork and the lawyers get involved and they will be specific <laughs> if they want to be Other, most of them are very relaxed on it it's they want a size to be the same and they want 
it to be able to carry the signal consistently mm -hmm. or some need to be black and white but for the most part the curators make up those decisions in the end and it's very uh malleable uh i know that a lot of people uh that watch this show constantly ask me and watch the channel ask me about the dotronics crts and um i thought since i had you here we could take a couple minutes and just venture off and talk about dotronics and uh just to give a little bit of a, a little anecdote i was at houston and i uh i talked to you know we had planned for a nice long pvm class on restoring and working on a 2030 which i had worked on a tons of those uh but then you asked about dotronics which i have never worked on and had even a chance to see and so we did a class on it and it was more almost discovering what was going it's on with it right <laughs> and uh so you have more experience with the dotronics You've been around you guys have eight of them and the DN25, those are the 25 inches, I'm guessing, right? Yep. That's what I thought. Um, you brought one of them in. Um, you know, what What do you think about them? How, like, why don't you give us a little bit of feedback on, like, your usage of them and how they perform? So I met, talked to Kurt years ago, and it took us many years to get approval to buy these. Um, the... And Bob did the interview with him, which was very fun. Yeah, we're talking about Kurt, the guy who is like the the last. It wasn't his family starting. Yeah, the, the story. His family started. A, they basically made monitors for the government, so okay, they had professional right. monitors that like NASA used, and they were used for ultrasound machines. And that was what he talks about in his talk with Bob. Is they were the end of that all happened when they moved to flat screens, mm -hmm. and they were basically starting to shut down. And they got a call from MoMA in New York and asked them if they could make TVs for them. Because so it was basically right around when Sony cut off production, they were trying to find a new source. I think MoMA has 200 TVs from him, probably. Oh, wow. It's it's a lot. Like, LACMA has over 100, I think. They've, they've like, he's done really well, which is great for him. And I, I was trying to get about at least 20 just to have as a backup. But for them, it's, they, he bought just a ton of new old stock tubes and boards. He made his own interface board to work with them. It's it's a very simplistic set. It is the tube in a metal chassis. It looks very similar to like the Barco square TVs from the mm. 80s. It's a very mm. basic metal chassis. You can have speakers in it if you want. The speakers actually sound very good, I'm surprisingly. It has a very rudimentary menu system in it. Um, we've had three of them running for three years now uh nine to five every single day or nine to nine every single day and they still work like they're perfect like yeah. i had no issues with them the issue that moma has with them is they have no shielding it's a metal mm. box with the parts in it and moma's around a subway so they have interference issues all the time i mean all consumer tvs are gonna have that problem in new york city too yeah they're gonna have a, well, yeah. i mean well houston's big also but yeah they do have, have subways. <laughs> subways and a lot going on there yeah, so um, that's kind of what I could see is I really uh, like the metal design of them, and I think that that would be awesome to be able to just um, have that design to throw other tubes in because, like yep. you say, you're actually putting um, almost the guts and the tube from another set inside these shells with their own interface boards and... Um, but so let's talk about like you say the good thing about them is is they were they had they felt fit that need for the look and then they were very stackable right yeah they have indentations for the feet they're meant to be stacked literally they're yeah. perfectly flat on each side and they're he he designed them for museums by doing that and there are no buttons on the front there's just a hole that the IR sensor is hiding behind so you cannot turn it on without the remote it'll turn right. on if you give it power but you have no control and he uses a very generic remote that's easy to replace and he'll give you the like i have the service code to get in and so we have it set to have a certain volume it starts on for the work normally it starts at zero but we do that so i don't have to go and up the volume every single day yeah um, but yeah they've the timer works really well we've been using s i got them specifically with s video and composite and but he has boards with component video and it'll do RGB if you really want, but component most of the time. Yeah, is fine. I couldn't imagine RGB being much of a need for you and your no. applications as much as it is a gaming thing. Yeah. So, 
Uh, maybe if there was a computer thing like set up for some reason, a retro PC or something. But uh, yeah, I kind of felt like that was one of the great things about that monitor. It was specifically designed to stack, I mean, really high. Like if we were talking about some of those Namjoon Pikes, I remember they would not only stack them, but put them all together and could be suspended on a wall tied together. And it would seem to be 10 or plus monitors maybe i don't know if they're actually stacked together if they were tied together they, but those would be ran i think he'll i think they go four or five high yeah. safely but okay. beyond that you can reinforce and do right, whatever you want right. though they're i mean it's a metal box you can drill into it and put <laughs> hangers on it they're insanely easy to work on the back just comes off yeah like there's I remember eight that. screws and it's just a cavern inside there so but the the biggest probably issue is that if you get inside there it really is just an empty space and if you compare that with like the 2030s or the 2530s from Sony, they have an immense amount of metallic shielding inside around the tube even yep. to try to prevent uh, interference and purity problems. And uh, so that's one of the drawbacks of the tube is it's using a lot of that. Uh, com it's almost like com um, consumer level hardware where it's it's open and naked back there kind of and it allows for interference to get into the tube some interesting that we have the artist version of that tv i just put together i'll send you the picture so you can put them up yeah. but we're showing the namjoon pike documentary this weekend at the museum and oh like okay. i would not have if i had known that i would have scheduled this trip a different weekend um but pbs did it so it's available on pbs you don't have to go to houston to see it but we acquired 20 25 inch tvs from another museum in town and it was from um we had a local video artist named andy mann and he would do just it was very like local no budget versions of what namjoon pike did so he would do he had a piece called the tree and they were just in this like large shape and it had a christmas tree on it that would go around all of them and it was a lot of stacking and videos being just broken out between the channels so what he did was take they look like Panasonic's because they they are professional because they have in and out for composite and have mm -hmm. DNC, so they're like mid range professionals. But he took the entire case off and put them in a plywood box that is just all the surrounds, and then he had uh, brackets in the front, so the tubes mounted to the front. You can see around the tube; it is not a seal at all, so you can see straight through on the edge. And then he just drilled the board into the bottom of the wood. And then the input board on the back is just flapping around. <laughs> and the power cable is also just loose. Just so loose. The, like, it's not even held down with, like, a U-bracket or anything. It is <laughs> insane in there. Like, you kill yourself so... Like, there's no oh. back on it. They are just breeze flowing through them. So uh -huh. they were in storage. He, he died uh, 20 years ago or so. And they did a wow. final installation when they did this kind of video art showcase at the museum 20 years ago or so. And they were in that, and then they've been in storage since. So they were selling their storage facility. So I talked to them, and we basically kept them from getting crushed. And they we put 12 of them up as a 4 by 3 like wall showing, and I edited mm -hmm. the Namjoon Pike trailer. And so it's just playing on six different channels, and it just looks fun. Oh, that's awesome. What we yeah. found is he screwed around with the TVs, and some of them are the images upside down. Yeah. Some it's upside down and reversed. Okay. And there's no control. He just messed with the wiring and did that. Yeah. He just did the, it's, he like swapped the yoke yeah. wiring so that they would, it's right. It's ridiculous. Like I turned it on, like video is down here and it's backwards. Like what is, and we're, you can reach the buttons with a chopstick. Like you still read the end and the buttons are still on the board. So you can like push in there and it, he just wired it. I was like, Oh, oh obviously wow. we can fix this, but no, but wow. uh, like half of them have like purity issues, but it, it's perfect for this. Like one, the composite didn't work. So I shoved, just the Luma in from S video. Mm -hmm. I basically shoved composite into an S video breakout. So yeah. it's just pushing black and white, but it looks incredible. So yeah, I'll send you the, that's the, yeah, video put, put, it. A, put it, we'll, um, show a picture of it. I did see the picture you sent me of, I guess those units. Cause it sounded like it, the, uh, when you're no, the ones that. I was talking about. Yeah. The ago. Wooden, um, They're so heavy. It's ridiculous. That's, that's just great. So these, these are, uh, Basically, this artist went and almost homemade, I mean, did homemade experimentation with these. He CRTs made his own, and his, his he wanted own. them to stack, and that's how he yeah. did that. I mean, they were not stackable before, but Well, not just that, he went in and did all this other <laughs> yeah. stuff, and 
man, you just got to think that's crazy. Cause like you say, you could easily, the older you go back into CRT, the easier you could be to shock yourself or someone. I'm sure he did. I mean, <laughs> he did not live very long, so I don't remember how he died. I didn't <laughs> know of him when he, but people loved him. So yeah, we're, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get more information about his history, but the museum doesn't have any of his pieces. Cause he was more of an outsider artist in town. Yeah. So we don't necessarily the mfa isn't really the most outsider museum in the world so that's kind of what the contemporary museums tend to do but yeah that one's we put that up i finished it yesterday at about three okay we, i was like we were like carrying because they were storing them at my friend's house because they i had to blow them out because they've been in a warehouse for 15 years they're covered in yeah. bugs and rat whatever so <laughs> we brought them finally just carried them all in there and hooked them up and like three didn't work so we swapped them out with other ones and got it all running instantly all these kids were just staring at it, just yeah. fascinated by it. It's just been watching younger people interact with the tube TVs, especially is very interesting. And just what's so fun huh. about working at the museum is you get to watch how people interact with, cause I design every video piece at the museum and install it. And they're all very different and you can see what fascinates people and what doesn't. And like so anybody who's under 20 is probably not going to have much experience with these TVs unless their just grandparents still won't get rid of it or something. So that's, it's just very fun to see that and be able to like explain what's happening to them like they look behind it so we had to put a little barrier to make sure nobody tries to touch it oh so you yeah just reach in and just poke it <laughs> like, this oh, is no. obviously yeah. gonna kill somebody so yeah. yeah yeah no that's that's uh that's really interesting and and good to see because i have um uh, always been concerned that you know if if there's nobody out there working on these things, they will all just go away because the vast majority of um, new tech has obviously gone a, a completely different direction, and rightfully, you know, so you still shouldn't, you know, we still shouldn't be filling the earth with new tubes for the entire planet. But um, at the same time, there's just such a distinction between a CRT and then the way uh, modern displays really look, and even the way they work, obviously. Uh, so hearing that younger generations have an appeal to it is nice. Does that help? Like, does that influence, I guess, would you say how many more, I mean, obviously probably since you've tripled your list, since you got there, how many more exhibits you bring in that are involving like CRTs is that makes others more it, in the museum, more open to I it. I would say it's very similar at every museum that it's up to the curators you have yeah. and your director. Cause we have one curator that is extremely interested. Like we finally acquired a work on 35 millimeter, an old Bruce Connor film that we explicit, like they have a digital version, but we're like, no, we want a 35 cause it was made on 35 millimeter film. So we wanted that to have as an archival version. And there's been more of an interest in having those, original copies like we had there was this whole problem with video art in the early 2000s is all these studios went to dvd they would send you dvds we would get latin artists from brazil south america central america sending dvds that were ntsc and they had converted their pal video over to ntsc so it's already changed from its original design at its core and now it's in dvd which is a terrible format to be dealing with now the, the compression is just outrageous it all looks terrible like the mm -hmm. blacks are all gray it's horrible so we've been reaching out to artists and getting original vhs tapes they send them to us because we can basically digitize anything at that point i think the only player i don't have is high eight right now so we'll we can <laughs> wow. capture anything like we have an amazing laser disc player that's still going after 35 years so this has been kind of my mission. I've, we've taken all the tape based things that we have in the collection, digitized all of them to just make sure they don't degrade anymore. And are contacting these artists that sent DVDs out to get original PAL copies, original like tape versions. Sometimes you, we got a Umatic tape recently from a Venezuelan piece. So that's been, as we've basically helped the curators understand it more. So video art for most museums, other than like the Tate and MoMA, was just an easy thing to collect. You buy a tape, it sits on a shelf in cold storage and you just play with it every six years when you install it. But that's changed over the last five years or so. All the conservators around the world, I went to a thing at NYU years ago when I uh, was able to meet Bob while I was in town and introduced him to MoMA. But the everybody's been getting together to figure out what to do about this because they've reached the end of CRTs. The tapes are all going bad and 
the DVDs are starting to go bad as well, and they're, we're dealing with how they don't make 4x3 displays that are flat at over 19 inch. So right, yeah. Roma basically bought all of them. They have these Hitachis that are third, I think, forty-two inch. Yeah, that Bob got to see when he was there, but they bought all those, so they don't exist. So we're everybody's trying to get a solution for the future, and it was just like weekend discussion of what to do about video art in general and who like how everybody can kind of help each other out and find mm -hmm. ways to maintain things because you can't showing something like Nam June Pike is the most extreme example, but the you do not get the same image whatsoever, especially with video art on a modern flat screen. And most of these video artists used the nuance of the way the tube generated the image. And that was essential to how they, like the flickering was important to them. Maybe they wanted it on RF because they wanted right. that lower quality image specifically. So you want, we're trying to reach out, get, we have a whole like five page questionnaire that goes out to every artist. And it is like, what display do you want it on? How big? Like, can it be projected? Is it film? Like, is it stereo, mono? How, like, what cable quality? It's like very, but that has to be done before they die. Because you're, oh, yeah, after that, yeah. you're just trying to figure it out. And you're just trying to guess. And I think that a lot of people can definitely relate to that because there's always the argument of what was the, even the people that develop the video games that everybody's crazy about. You know, there's a perfect example of how that medium doesn't translate well onto a modern display. So neither would the analog film and anything um, like that you're working on. It's the same. It's the same kind of issue, and I think people can kind of relate to it on that. Yeah, like the Sonic waterfall being yeah. brought up. Ever like half the my life of gaming videos are the Sonic <laughs> waterfall at some point to just get over this disconnect between perfect RGB video on a modern display through a frame meister or something, and you lose that filtering effect. Like all of the little checkerboard patterning they used to try and hide the fact that they couldn't do transparencies is lost at that point. So then you get to, but it's nice, all this evolution, all these people that have helped, like, especially Trey and Corey and the, like, even like Jason back years ago, just all these people and Voltar and all them have created all this insane technology that never, I don't know how it even got, it's, it's bizarre that this all got created. Like Momo, you mean like, like the newer stuff all the, that they're doing now, like the Frame Meister's yeah, evolution well, to to like the Retro Tank stuff, like yeah. with Mike Chi and things. Yeah, there's there all it the is kind of crazy boxes. Fixes. Yeah, because there like, people, there's museums are just buying like the cheapest thing off Amazon to get HDMI to composite for TVs, and that's like why I brought up the Atlona thing. Cause yeah, it's the best box that I found so far. They were like four hundred dollars new, but now they're under a hundred. Yeah, that's. I, I was glad you brought one for me that has everything, and I actually got this recently for cheap special off of eBay that was like promised to me working, but it didn't come with anything else. So that nice uh, version you sent me has everything I need to get going. So that I'm very interested in testing that thing out, and even. Um, the, because the first thing everybody's going to ask me is, there, is there any lag or latency in it? Mm -hmm. Because that's nothing that you would really even care about for video, really. That's more of just a um, video game issue. If people want an easy way to go from yeah. HDMI down to... You can get S-Video and Composite out of that and Stereo Audio extracted from that. That's even nice, too. And it does NTSC and PAL. Yeah, we've been using... With the Dotronics, I have two of the players using two of these for three years, no issues. Okay, What's yeah. They've been, and these have been on, like, running constantly for over, like, three years now. Like, yeah. Extremely dependable. They should have limited lag, because they're meant to be used in signal chains for video editing or production work, so they should be pretty decent, but I haven't. We'll see. Yeah, I got the tester. We'll do it. We'll do I'll do a test and check it out, because that'll just be fun. Um, I, I like it, too, just to be able to easily get HDMI down, mm -hmm. even just to play a video uh, like, you know, you guys are using it, so I'll have a lot of fun with that one. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's anything else here we uh, want to touch on, we could jump on that um, before we kind of start to run sure. things down if there's a couple topics um so speaking of moma there's a show that's called signals i believe that mm -hmm. is one of their main exhibitions right now it's up through i'm pretty sure the middle of july i'm heading up there at the end of june to see it, and it's kind of a retrospective on video art it sounds amazing 
So if anybody is in New York between now and roughly the middle of July, try and check it out. I'll uh, send Steve some info after I see it, but it looks very impressive. And I've seen a few photos from their website, but it looks like something I would love to get down in Houston if possible. But um, instead, I get to go visit it and I'll try and stop and see Bob and whoever else is up in New York at that time. And Yeah, say hi. that's, um, you know. I got I got to go up to MoMA in February right before um, I, I got I got sick, so it was like literally two weeks before that happened. But that was uh, that was very impressive, right down in the middle of New York City, in uh, Manhattan, and um, I unfortunately did not have time to go in that day and check out the museum. But I want to go back, and that sounds like a pretty great. Um, show so yeah if there's anybody i know we do have some people up there in brooklyn and stuff at the uh, arcade they should definitely go check out that piece this month yeah and if, i mean if you can get up there you should yeah. definitely get in touch with them and see if they'll show i know it to you, so let me go see it they said they uh, would they'd be happy to i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> spend a whole day with them so they can okay. explain how they put it together and that's a lot of the museum stuff is so in houston we for being a large city we're very isolated like dallas is five hours away austin three hours away and there aren't we are the biggest museum in houston so we support other museums so i work with every museum that doesn't have staff to help them install video works we loan equipment out constantly and if they are trying to offload things to make space we'll hold on to it for them like we have some tvs from rice right now the university that has a they have a video building that just got torn down they had a film uh, theater in there that's 50 years old so we took on some of their equipment to keep it in running so we can basically run it every so often so it's not just sitting in storage but the what i've been trying to do when i visit me other museums is to get more like to get every to see everybody do a face-to-face -face discussion and see who's interested in more collaboration and sharing ideas about like for me the tvs have kind of established we figured out what's good but i'm trying to as these digital projectors evolve which is a huge problem for us they keep dropping models every few years so but they reuse lenses so one example is i'm certain this lens from 15 years ago is being used in a new panasonic so if i have 20 of those lenses and i know that this current panasonic i'll save fifty thousand dollars on lenses because they're all like two thousand dollars each for these lenses so things like that are extremely helpful and we're we'll probably get to the point as we reach end life for crts even the ones that kurt's selling with dotronics where we'll just be sending them to each other to help out. And mm -hmm. if someone wants to do a Namjoon Pike retrospective, we might just send them from everywhere around the country with the way, because art moves through these companies that just have big semis that are padded effectively. And that's kind of how the TVs will have to move. And you've had to do that with your shipping, especially, which is great that that's, it's really helpful yeah. that you're helping people understand that because even the ones we're getting from people are just like always broken. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to uh, sometimes get across to some people, but at the same time it's gotten better. And um, I've definitely talked to a lot of people always about, you know, not, not trying to just go the way of ground shipping um, unless you absolutely have to. And I, I <laughs> I'd rather you do something that's like, the air shipment or something, whatever non ground, because they just the, throw them the ground, they throw them, they put them on conveyor belts, they do drops off these conveyors, and it's it's just it's just really luck. You could pack it perfectly and it still breaks. Um, so what, yeah, one thing, one more shipping thing. So, bought, uh, Kurt with Dotronic sends them in these like half pallet crates that uh -huh. are it's I forget what they call it. it's like it's not plywood, but it's like just a bunch of wood glued on top of each other in sheets. Yes. Uh, so he makes those, they're palletized, and the boxes, they're in boxes with styrofoam pieces around them, and then those boxes have styrofoam around them inside this crate. So there's four per crate, and we got four, so we got two of those crates, and the one of them showed up, and it was just crushed, and the and I was like, what the hell? So we called him, and he's like, oh, it's insured, fine, just, just we'll send them back, and then I'll send you new ones. And we, but we pulled security video and the guy delivering it was just basically like an end point delivery from whoever the main shipper was. It was just in this truck and he was just yanking it. He had one pallet, whatever, uh, tongue on there and was just yanking it out and dragging it. It looked like it, he just crushed it on the way out. So we just sent him the video of that and he got his claim. But I was like, you can like, he tried so hard 
and they weren't even they were just like bent like the metal casing was bent like they weren't they were totally serviceable still yeah i was like that's just insane that's like, crazy you can do everything you want but i mean they were insured so it worked i mean that was like a ten thousand dollar claim wow so i mean that and sure i'm hopefully the shippers learned a slight <laughs> lesson from that because they lost <laughs> i don't think that guy's a lot of money on anymore. that one but like uh, nobody <laughs> I, people have cameras at their houses so that might help. yeah but, that was just it was infuriating so we needed it was a month of delay to get the new ones and mm -hmm. it was everything was on a time constraint so even yeah, the best laid plans will uh fall to somebody's negligence we're talking about trying to find a piece of hardware that's extremely rare and you finally find it and then it's in good condition and then you're like sweating the whole time it's being shipped because that's like the last step and it can literally go from, I finally found this thing, to getting your hopes up and just, mm. you know, opening the box to pieces. Well, that's what I'm doing right now. Picking up an old truck and driving it back yeah, to Texas. Yeah, trying so to halfway it across the it. country. But. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about real quickly here, uh, shift, because that's like the last step. And it can literally go from, I finally found this thing, to getting your hopes up and just, mm. you know, opening the box to pm and just how how meticulous you guys are for your storage on even not just crts but all kinds of stuff well i was in the army for a while so that helps i think if there one thing that i got out of that uh, other than some college money was a uh, being drilled into you that preventative maintenance is the most important thing of owning any thing that is a machine or an electronic device is it will save you a ton of money over time and help ensure that it's working and also just cataloging and organizing. So we've, it was kind of, we just had a bunch of equipment in a corner when I got there in uh, one of the tunnels under the museum. And we, I kept pushing things farther and farther out into the tunnel where the art handlers keep crates and that I pretty sure made them mad. So we got somebody to buy us a cage. So we put a cage around that space. So we ended up with that. And then we finally, I think the closet was ready when you were there. So everything moved. It's basically a 60 foot long closet that's six feet wide. So it's just a whole long row of boltless shelving that uh, I think we got from Uline or Tensco. Mm -hmm. This stuff's amazing. You have basically the exact same one right here. Yeah. Um, we have like the most expensive one you can buy, but they're, they're great. Like they hold six or 800 pounds on each one and mm -hmm. it's very easy to get them in and out. But that we have them all lined up um, for the projectors. I'll keep a log of how many hours are on each one for the ones that have lamps and not the laser ones. And for the TVs, I just have an inventory that just a huge spreadsheet of where everything's going. And then we can try to basically equalize them. So like the Dotronics ones that are coming out, I think in two months, that's rotating finally after three years. So those will basically be put away to not be used in the next one. Okay. So we're, we try to just keep things as even as possible because it's just constantly rotating and working with so like in a curator wants something for a show we'll just set up like three of them or something and with for most of the curators it's like an aesthetic choice because for all of that show like all the the way things are hung the seats that are in there the pedestals used for art is all has to fit like an aesthetic vision for the installation itself or if the artist is very specific and wants some color but one like weirder one we did when the anniversary of the moon landing happened i think four or five years ago we did a show of photography from that mm -hmm. and the photography department asked us to put together something as well so we got a TV, a period tv for, i think from the early 60s it's like a magnavox or phillips or something a little orange tv and i had the shop in town that works on our tvs modify it to have a composite input so it's just a little rca cable hanging out and we got an old footage of Cronkite and the news covering the moon landing. So we mm -hmm. plugged it into there. It had a huge antenna sticking out of it. And it just nice. played that on a loop. So, But we specifically found an old uh, wood grain paneled pedestal to put it on. So it was like yeah. overly, it was very ridiculous looking. But people were just, like, much like this video wall that I talked about with the Namjoon Pike, like people would just stand there and like stare at it. And the image yeah. looked terrible. Like That's... it was such an old TV. It was all black and white. It was all washed out, but it just kind of brought you back to that time in a sense. Yeah, though that's but that's what, like you said that was part of it anyway. It wasn't like the picture quality would have been that good back then for a broadcast, and just the fact that it was broadcast. Um, so 
yeah, preventive maintenance obviously is a big important thing, but also there at the museum, you guys have great controls over your environment. Oh, because yeah. like if you're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about relative, in Houston, relative you can go outside of your building and let a piece of equipment sit there and just rot in a couple of years, but then you guys have your humidity taken care of, right? And I mean, temperature control. Things like that. Everything's outrageously specific in that build. Like, different galleries have different hip because different artworks have humidity requirements. Mm -hmm. They'll put um, desiccant inside pedestals. They they have specially designed pedestals that they have little tubs of desiccant beads in there to absorb moisture in the air. Uh, there's a cord cold storage where the photographs works on paper things that degrade much more quickly, especially in bad temperature environments. And all our films are stored in there. The uh, works all the video works basically are kept in there the dvds and tapes and whatnot are all stored on a big shelf like if you're able to get to minneapolis you should see the walker their video collection is unbelievable and they have a vault that there was and then there's a hole busted in the back so the vault's extended more and then another hole <laughs> over here because they their video collection is absolutely massive and they walk me through it's just incredible to behold just rows of tapes it's all umatic beta cam all these master tapes because that was the master for everything up until like the mid 2000s yeah. um that's an advantage you guys have where you can prolong the life of electronics as long as pretty much possible um by doing what you're doing with the preventive maintenance and temperature and humidity control but also i like the way you were explaining the sh um scheduling and the shuffling around more moving uh, you know s some go in to circulation some come out and so that's a great idea because yeah. it's not always good to just keep electronics and things sitting there not never using mm -hmm. them yeah and we're part of we've actually emptied that closet and had to move it to another building so mm -hmm. they're filling in concrete around there so we just put everything back in so it's in there but not organized yet but what i'm trying to do with this is have basically one of those long extension cords just as a plug every few feet and just have everything plugged in or being able to be plugged in so you can just turn it on and then have a big composite distribution box back there to just shoot signals out so that we can basically run like a color bar signal to it for testing just because it's nice. just a huge some of these are so damn heavy like <laughs> yeah. i do not want to move it off the shelf and put on a cart and then set up a, something to put some signal through it so hey i know like these at uh, the mitsubishi you've got on your list i know the ones God, that so uh, i mean nothing was bigger than the ones you got you used to have there that you sent over to your friend's game shop the 40 inch ones yeah, uh, that are, were for we had to lift those out of those crates oh, to put God. them on these carts that a friend of the old actually the old installer at the museum helped mm -hmm. dave build those uh the the whole setup to hold them so yeah we're, we're finally integrating them they still will not maintain purity at oh, all I like don't they're see. infuriating they look incredible though <laughs> so we'll he'll, we're setting up an s video extension to those so he can yeah. run a saturn and run like i don't know mvc2 or portal combat or something on there great. so it, it, they're they're very impressive they uh there's something else but yeah they're they're large and very tough to keep the image pure but they were those are some big ones you also you got i mean you just had some really huge ones i remember the like those yeah the 1900 cvms and pvms those were big and then some of those other sony's that were the older ones i think i don't think it's on here we yeah have, we have a 25 inch of that same that, that's cvm one yeah. Yeah, that was the old security training monitor i found it in a like an old meeting room it was just sitting there and they hadn't used it in like 10 years yeah so i just pulled it out of there and it still like amazingly works perfectly <laughs> but it's from that era where the back board was uh -huh. like whatever compressed sawdust or it's like almost cardboard like it so doesn't just, even have a metal back yeah it's just a piece of wood like the old 40s and 50s tvs all had that and it, it's very funny like the cap that goes around the back of the tube where the mm -hmm. fucking the neck board is the it's just another like i don't know like almost sawdust feeling just piece that is loose on there that fits inside the main backboard it's very of that era for their design but yeah, it's just kind of sitting around right now. We And I've also been working, we just find TVs around town, so we'll take the van around and pick up TVs that people are giving away, or if they're like $20, we'll go pick it up. And then either we, I've been collecting them to just give to local artists. So the consumer ones, like we have a bunch of the silver Wega type ones. So it's like Sony, whatever, Sanyo, whatever company makes Sylvania or, or any of that. And we'll just 
we're not going to use those for a show, but we have an art school next door, the Glacelle School, that has this graduate program that does art and half of their stuff every cycle is video art. So we're always helping them with that. So we'll just give them a bunch of those to just do whatever they want with. Or if there's local artists that need that, we'll loan it out to them or just give it to them because I don't really want to maintain 100 TVs. But it's, <laughs> it, in the end, it's just to try to help things continue. Yeah. Or Dave will sell them at a shop or something if it's something that the museum didn't buy and I just found it. So yeah. it's anything to just keep like he's not selling them for a lot either. So it's pretty easy to just get into that without well, having to ship a PVM or something. That's that's great. That's like there's there's the shop that we were talking about in in uh, New York a second ago, Brooklyn. They do the same thing where they will sell mostly 20 inches and under. He really doesn't like to take oh, anything no. over than that. Nothing you don't, over and you 20. don't want to. It's terrible. Yeah, it's hard and possible to get rid of really. And then, yeah, it's like 50, 75 bucks or like the normal price a lot of times for him. So I don't know if, you know, it's, it's really nice. I think to anybody just to be able to go somewhere, if they're like looking for something and they can get a TV that works, that's not that expensive. Um, and, but they know it works and look at it and in a game shop is even cooler. So, uh, it's always good to help out, you know, keep, keep them out of landfills too. All right. Yeah, Brutus. Uh, well, um, I don't know if there was anything else. We have one more segment, the gift segment. <laughs> so uh, the original of this envelope is screws for something oh. that Dave's eventually, or Steve's eventually <laughs> going to work on and everyone will learn about. But yeah. I don't want to ruin the surprise. That's we'll leave that in. mystery. The other oh. is a don't mess with Texas patch. There you go. That he can put on to whatever. Iron it on right yeah. here yeah. above my... Very important. Retro Tech logo. There we go. And I had this <laughs> lying around that I hope a large fits. It's a oh, reproduction thanks. of the Guy Aris shirt for the yeah. Genesis game. I remember this. So, yeah. Uh, Excellent. That's well, uh, thank you. That's well, how about weird. that? You never know. You know, all these nice gifts. That's great. Thank you, Kirsten. I uh, I do have something for you, but it's not even down here. And well, that's fine. But you I'll tell uh, well, tell everybody. It's and I don't know if you still even want this. It's a uh, a rack. <laughs> that you can strap two pvm eight inches to for like rack mounting oh well we love those so I have two or three of them that i don't just know been acquiring slowly like that. i knew you're remember oh, great. something like the, that the dual rack yeah yeah, those are yeah. Terrific. all right everybody i want to say a quick thank you for watching today and uh hopefully you enjoyed that interview with kirsten thank you again to kirsten for helping us out and doing that interview and also if you happen to find yourself in Houston you should definitely do yourself a favor and check out the museum there and uh, go support the work that Kirsten and his team do uh, by showing up and checking out the museum they have an incredible selection of things that really will blow your mind one more time if you enjoyed this video please do hit the like for me and I appreciate you and I'll see you next time with some more retro content